Thank you for that. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started with this. This is a very cool presentation put together by um, Center for Strategic Studies, Strategic and International Studies. So right off the bat, I want to say full credit to CSIS.org for doing the research and putting this together. They are a brilliant think tank full of professionals that make presentations that make my sub briefs look like amateur work. These guys are real strategic thinkers, brilliant minds from all sorts of backgrounds that come together. And they're one of the major strategic think tanks uh, in Washington, D.C., that, that provides free evaluations like this one on CSIS.org. So definitely support them. Go over to their website, read their vast library of uh, presentations like this because um, they do a great job. Today, we're going to talk about China's maritime power projection network. How <clears throat> lethal is China right now in terms of maritime power projection naval warfare? So from the piece here, we're going to read, uh, says China's deployment of radar, anti-ship and anti-air missile platforms and combat aircraft uh, to its outpost in the South China Sea has greatly expanded its ability to project power into waters far from its own coast. This feature will illustrate how these three capabilities are fundamentally linked and how China's aircraft carriers take advantage of them to comfortably conduct operations at greater distances. Here we go. So, Isle of Capabilities, that's these little white dots right here. China operates four large outposts with 10,000 foot runways in disputed areas of the South China Sea, Woody Island, Fiery Cross Reef, Mischief Reef, and Subby Reef. These are three dots right here. All right, so let's zoom in and take a look at these. China has deployed substantial military assets to these islands, including HQ-9 anti-air missiles and YJ-12 Bravo anti-ship cruise missiles, uh, sensing and communicating facilities like, you know, radars and radios, um, hangars capable of housing military transport, patrol, and combat aircraft. Let's take a quick look at what the uh, HQ-9 is. The HQ-9 is this mobile uh, S-300, essentially, uh, Russian air defense that China copied and built their own version of it, but it has the same capabilities of the S-300, which will shoot most anything down inside a 60-mile bubble. You know, anything that's not a fifth-generation fighter, bombers especially, very vulnerable to this one. So that's what they're putting here. Also, with the, um, what was the other one? Oh, the cruise missiles. All right, so the cruise missiles look like this. Uh, this credit goes to NavyRecognition.com. Uh, this is an older article, but I want you to look at the pictures here. So notice how everything here that we're talking about is mobile. It's not a static defense that can easily be targeted in advance for like a tomahawk strike. We would need to have near real-time um, information on where these are deployed before we could even target them. And then at any moment they could move them, we would need to... Uh, you know, adjust our targeting data in flight in real time, which we can do. But it, my point is it makes these much harder to hit with conventional cruise missiles, conventional munitions, without having some sort of sensor, um, whether it's a laser designator or something like that on these targets at once. So this is the YJ-12, a next generation supersonic anti-ship missile uh, that was unveiled in 2015. They're putting these on those islands. So they have good air defense and they have good anti-ship uh, capability as well. Uh, let's see the YJ-19, it says here is an anti-ship missile, meaning Eagle Strike, was designated by the Third Academy of China Aerospace Science and Industry Corporation as a CASIC or High Wing Mechanical Electronic Technology Corporation. It's fitted with a liquid fuel ramjet uh, with a combined booster and combustion chamber. That's what pushes it up to that supersonic speed there. Uh, the YJ-12 first picture emerged in 2013. Uh, the missile appears to be somewhat similar in design to the Russian KH-31 air-to-surface missile. Or the U.S.-made uh, GQM-163 uh, Alpha Coyote supersonic sea skimming missile. So they probably just copied the Russian design because China and Russia have a long history of doing that. But I wouldn't be surprised if they have some American technology in this too. Because for example, we found, we discovered in 1992, China somehow got a hold of an ADCAP um, 
mod one guidance section and they added ad cap capability to their torpedoes in 1992 yeah as far as guidance goes not the engine room part uh the guidance section so they've they've stolen and borrowed from uh, different countries including the united states to build these weapons themselves all right let's get back to the piece that's the weapon systems that they're putting on the these four islands that have these extremely long runways so big that you can see them from space this is like a satellite photo Okay, the operational range of the fighter aircraft, such as the J-15 from these islands, in theory is quite far. And this, this is their range if they did not have to go back to the air base. So you could almost cut this in half if they were going to come back and land back at the island. A lot of these, um, like up here, they would land and divert to other, other airfields. Uh, in reality, okay, yeah, this is the more realistic range. In reality, combat aircraft can only be effectively operated within range of available radar and sensing platforms. Without external radar coverage, they have limited awareness of their surroundings. And this is one of the Achilles heels of both the Russian Air Force and the Chinese Air Force. They heavily depend on GCI or ground control intercept. Uh, they need a radar operator that has a large radar, whether it's airborne or on the ground, that can detect contacts and vector them in the right direction and looking at the right altitudes to intercept. So they aren't so much limited by their operational range or their fuel. Uh, they're more limited by the GCI capabilities of the Chinese facilities on these four islands. Okay, airborne early uh, warning control or AWACS, uh, like the KJ-500, known to operate on these islands, uh, provide greater radar coverage than the ground-based sensors. The KJ-500 shown here above Subby Reef can sense surface targets out to 200 nautical miles and high-flying non-stealth targets uh, out to 388 miles. So if you were to put this you know, overlay on all four of those islands, it would cover much more of the northern part of the South China Sea. And just to give you an idea of what the KJ-500 is, it's up here in the corner. I've also got a, a larger picture of it here for you. It's it's very weird. It's kind of like our E-3, but an E-2. I mean, it's somewhere between an E-2C and an E-3 uh, for, for the United States. Um, this, this was from a website called Weibo.com. Also a great place to get your body pillows right here but this is what it looks like uh, from the side it's got the radar dish here on top and it is propeller driven weeboo.com okay but the AWACS uh, aircraft also have limitations on their operational range without any difference or without any defensive capabilities of their own they rely on external protection such as ground-based anti-air and anti-ship missiles from Chinese outpost and outside missile coverage uh, the KJ-500 would be an easy target for enemy fighters uh, or surface combatants because it doesn't have anything sort of chaff and flare we assume we ha it has that it honestly may not even have that we don't know but so these it's like rock, paper, scissors, you know, you've got the ground base um, defenses, we'll call them that need the protection of the fighters to kind of keep them alive. And the fighters can't really do their job without the airborne radar that, is, that, that the KJ 500, you know, gives them. So by defending the airborne radar, they're able to expand their operations out as far as that radar can see re re reliably and the missiles. Uh, whether it's the cruise missiles or the surface to air missiles on the islands, keep those planes in the air. So it's the symbiotic relationship between all three of those that make this strategy effective. All right, this is the uh, KJ 500's estimated radar range to surface level targets, so not airborne. This is just they can reliably detect surface contacts in these bubbles if they operate directly over the islands that they own while operating in both uh, anti-air and anti-ship missile coverage from the islands combat aircraft venturing beyond this range would be blind to surface threats unless they had their own uh, air to surface radar which they do not and that's kind of the what, what they're pointing out here they're very reliant on these radars okay fighters operating from the kj 500's radar range could strike targets an additional 250 nautical miles outside the surface radar coverage and that's assuming the longest uh, air to surface cruise missile that it's currently in the inventory can go out another 250 miles uh, each weapon such as the air launched yj-12 uh, anti-ship cruise missile has a range 
Uh, this range of 550 nautical miles from China's island outpost is a realistic strike range for combat aircraft operating from the bases within naval support. So we're just trying to give you an idea of what uh, we consider these illegal operations uh, can do. This is the coverage that this gives China here. Now, China obviously doesn't think that this is a legal occupation. They think that they're perfectly entitled to have these bases here uh, since they made the bases and they claim the islands. Uh, again, these islands are claimed by multiple countries, Philippines on this side, Vietnam on this side, um, uh, Born, I believe, claim a few down here as well. Carrier operations. So Chinese aircraft carriers have the potential to enable combat aircraft to operate safely at much farther ranges. Uh, but the carrier groups for Chinese carriers are really just a fraction of the United States carriers. They can only carry about 32 fighter aircraft and escort guided uh, missile destroyers and frigates. The carrier group has its own anti-air and anti-ship missiles, but the number of aircraft that they can field on one carrier is about a third or maybe even less than one United States aircraft carrier and about half of what the uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth can carry as well. So the relatively... Uh, they're, they're, they're less capable, let's put it that way, less capable than our aircraft carriers. And they, and, they, and they have a couple of them now too. Now the nice thing about the carriers is that they're mobile, right? So they can move within this, this region and enjoy the coverage of those ground-based uh, weapon systems as well. It says, as well as the radar can detect surface and air targets. That's true, the, um, the uh, frigates that go with the carrier, they all have really good radars, but they just can't see as far as that airborne radar can see and the dark part of the circle here that's the surface detection range the wider area the lighter uh, color this is the air detection range approximately as this uh, frigate <clears throat> frig sorry this fleet moves around so this is a mobile bubble if you will okay the carriers uh, radar range to surface contacts is limited to approximately 65 miles this limits the strike range of combat aircraft launched from the carrier without other support can one safely operate uh, within this radius. So if they don't have that KG-500 in the air, uh, they cannot reliably go outside this bubble and expect any kind of additional GCI information. They're going to be on their own. You know, they certainly can fly outside this range. Uh, they're welcome to do that, but they're going to be a lot less capable. And that's the point. Okay, these ranges can be extended, however, by AWACS aircraft operating within the defensive perimeter of the carrier strike group, which is likely what they're going to do. They'll just have the KG-500 that is a land-based aircraft over top of the fleet, giving them very um, E-2C-like Hawkeye conditions. This is very similar in range and capability of our E-2Cs. Uh, this extends their radar range out to 300 nautical miles, enabling the J-15s to strike up to 550 miles with their... Uh, YJ-12 cruise missile. So they could run out to the range and then shoot an additional, you know, 550 miles in all directions and potentially attack uh, sea targets. So we're going to back out now and take a little bit bigger picture of the entire region. Here we have the carrier limitations. So large AWACS aircraft like the KG-500 can't launch from China's existing aircraft carriers. In order to make use of the KJ-500 sensing capabilities, carriers need to maintain need to stay within the aircraft's maximum range from Chinese runways on the mainland or South China Sea. And that's kind of what this is showing here. The, uh, the uh, range of this aircraft in combination with its uh, sensing capability gives the Chinese carriers this range of motion with what we would call top cover. They, uh, they have good radar coverage assistance in this bubbled area. Another limitation on the carrier operations is the need to divert to airfields. To operate safely, combat aircraft need to, lead, need to have a divert airfield within range in case uh, they're unable to return to the carrier for any reason. The only runways in this region to which, which Chinese combat aircraft can reliably divert to are those on the Chinese mainland and on the outpost islands, these four islands down here. Um, there's, there's a really good point that I want to make, but I want to see if the piece makes it first. I'll give it the credit. Um, completing the network, Chinese aircraft carriers can operate within this area, maintaining a safe 400 nautical mile distance from the divert airfields currently available. So no matter what the carrier does, 
this is the operational envelope of the fighters that are on the carrier right here. Assuming that they could not return to the carrier for any reason, the, um, the fighter craft, the J-15s specifically, would not want to go outside this bubble. Let's see if they make the point here. I'll let them finish. I'm going to let you finish. Okay, carrier groups operate within that range can provide protection for ground-launched AWACT aircraft. Uh, the radar range of those aircraft, 700 nautical miles from either Chinese mainland or Chinese island outpost, is an effective range of Chinese carrier-launched fighters. So with that, we're going to add the weapon range on top of that to get the maximum coverage of carrier-launched uh, fighters with their uh, anti-ship cruise missiles, or they can even be ground attack cruise missiles, for a total of 950 nautical miles from Chinese airfields. This is the maximum operational range of the aircraft, radar coverage, weapon systems going out from uh, Chinese airfields. All right, full credit to CSIS. Okay, so one thing that they did not pick up on, and let's see if we can grab it here. Uh, I'm just going to grab this one right here because the next thing I'm going to talk about um, is the J-15. The YJ-15 cannot fuel in the air. It doesn't have air refuel capability in the 21st century. That shocked me when I learned that this morning. So they need to return to the airfield routinely just to top off their tanks again. That's a severe limitation. The second one are Chinese jet engines are extremely unreliable. They often return with just one of the two jet engines working. So, you know, they'll, they'll take off, obviously, with both of them working. But in flight, uh, they routinely come back with one failed engine for whatever reason. Uh, a lot of it has to do with craftsmanship and workmanship. Uh, the, the reliability of the engines that they're using right now is really poor. So you wouldn't want to go into a fight without having any faith in your engine, you know, expecting to maybe lose one before the fight even begins. It's going to put you at a real, real disadvantage if that happens. But what they did this weekend, what China did this weekend, kind of shifting gears here to uh, South China Morning Post, a piece written by Lawrence Chung, says Beijing sends a record 52 fighter planes to test Taiwan, sparking fear of mishaps. Uh, the PLA has sent 145 warplanes to the island's air defense identification zone since Friday as part of a strategy to ramp up pressure on Taiwan and test its air defense systems. In addition to flexing its military might for Taiwan, PLA is showing its strength um, before a joint drill involving Western forces in the South China Sea, Yeah, which is coming up. Um, surprised that they know about that. I didn't realize that was public, but apparently he's putting it out there. We're about to start doing war games with Taiwan and the South China Sea and a number of other countries. And when that happens, we'll talk about it. But we're not going to jump the gun here, Lawrence, like he's doing there. Oh, plus the air defense identification zone is not uh, Taiwan airspace. Those are two very different things. This often gets overlooked either because the journalists don't know that or they want to make it sound as if it's more menacing than it actually is. The air defense identification zone radiates all the way across the Formosa Strait into the South China Sea. It is much a much larger airspace than just Taiwanese airspace. OK, and then you have a third one in there called the um, exclusive economic zone, which is a different one entirely. But the ADIZ is the largest. People violate the ADIZ all the time. So I'm not downplaying what China is doing here. OK, because still they are intentionally violating this ADIZ to see what Taiwan does. And they're collecting data doing that. That's happening. But just because you flew into some nations, ADIZ isn't even a big deal. But because of the other factors surrounding this, it's more of a big deal than, than others. They are not violating Taiwan airspace. That's different. They're just in the uh, identification zone. I should find a map of that. And uh, I didn't do it today, but in the future, I'll find a map of what the ADIZ is just to show you how big it is. Uh, if you want, go ahead and Google it. And you'll see right now what I'm talking about. Okay, but back to the piece that Lawrence Chung writes. Taiwan's defense ministry said 52 mainland fighters flew um, to the self-ruled island Southwest Air Defense Identification Zone on Monday. A record number has prompted a fear of unintentional incidents between Taiwan and mainland China. Uh, the island said that it has scrambled jets to deploy missiles to warn off mainland military aircraft, including 34 J-16 fighters, and 12 H-6 bombers, two Su-30s, which I think that's this one up here. Oh, no, this is the J-16 here. That's the one with the, the problem with the engines, isn't it? Yeah, I think this one is the one that can't uh, re refuel in flight, I think. Don't hold me to that one. I might be wrong on that. 
Okay, uh, back to the piece. It says the, the latest development came from Beijing, sent 38 warplanes uh, to Taiwan's air defense zone on Friday, followed by 39 on Saturday, 16 on Sunday because they're godly people and they rest on Sunday. Uh, an analysts warned that conflicts between China and main, uh, Taiwan and mainland China could surface if the People's Liberation Army made incursions into uh, the Southeast ADIZ, a major point of access to Taiwan's Eastern military zone, a new normal. So that's what they're trying to do is by routinely doing this, making this a routine, making it not a big deal, which in my opinion, not a big deal outside the fact that these two nations really don't like each other and China keeps claiming it's going to invade it. That is the difference here. That's kind of what makes this a big deal when otherwise it wouldn't be that big of a deal to, to me. That's my opinion. Okay. Uh, Beijing, which sees itself as a self-ruled island and its territory that must be taken under control uh, by force if necessary, has sent 145 warplanes into the island's ADIZ since Friday. It's kind of repeating what it said at the beginning. I wonder if that's a mistype. Anyway, so it says, while most incursions took place at Taiwan's Southwest Air Defense Identification Zone, a dozen PLA warplanes, including 10 J-16 fighter jets, made nighttime incursions into Taiwan's uh, ADIZ on Friday. So I wonder, oh, oh, so, oh, from the Southeast. That's interesting. So they're, they're probing from different angles. Yeah. And they're just seeing what, what they do, you know, do they even notice? You know, of course, Taiwan's going to notice, but they're just checking. Uh, instead of their usual incursions into Taiwan Southwest ADIZ on Friday, the aircraft flew towards Bashi channel, uh, and made a left turn to the island's Southeast ADIZ, according to Taiwan's defense minister. So being pretty provocative in their maneuvers. Uh, analysts said that the large-scale incursions were a show of force to Taiwan and the United States, that they'll allow PLA's joint combat capabilities, I'm sorry, that they also showed PLA's joint combat capabilities, which included the ability to assemble warplanes from different military zones on the mainland and operate at night. Okay, yeah, that's true, they did do that. What is worth noting is the PLA's deployment of 10 J-16 fighters jets and uh, two H-6 bombers at nighttime missions, which include those of the Bashi Channel and Southeast Taiwan's ADIZ. So operating the H-6 at night is interesting. That's not a new capability, but they don't do that often. So they're, basically they're showing off. They're like putting on an air show for, for Taiwan. And it's, it's, having, it's having some effect. They're getting the response they want. China wants this. They want pieces written about them. They want people claiming how capable they are when in reality, China's strength is in its numbers. They have a lot of everything. <laughs> they have a lot of ships, submarines, weapons, planes, but all of it is very low quality compared to Western standards of military vehicles. Um, they're, they're more in line with Cold War Soviet reliability, which was not reliable at all compared to NATO reliability, which had its problems too. I'm not saying we're the, well, I guess we are the gold standard, but we're not perfect. Okay, so don't misunderstand me. But China suffers from a lot of reliability problems with its equipment, and it tries to overcome that with numbers. That's really how they're going about their business. Let's read from the bottom of the piece here. It says uh, the PLA wants to send a strong signal uh, to this joint drill, especially after Australia, the UK and the US formed a trilateral security pact, obviously targeting Beijing, referring to the AUKUS alliance. I like that. We're going to call it the AUKUS alliance now. Maybe that's the new name. AUKUS just sounds kind of weird. Like, what the hell's AUKUS? Hong said that although Beijing had ramped up the military pressure on Taiwan, it would currently had no plans to take the island back or send forces to attack. Really? That is a, is that a diplomatic statement? Because that has not been their public statement in the past. They have actually said the exact opposite of this. So who's Hong? Who's this Hong guy? We need to credit him for this. Alexander Hong Shisheng, a professor of international relations and strategic studies at Tom Kang University in Taipei. Okay, so this is a um, this is a Taiwanese professor saying that Beijing ramped up its military pressure, but currently has no plans to take the island back by force. He's uh, living in a dream that he's not correct on that, but I, I hope he's right, but he's not. Uh, on Monday, Taiwan's foreign minister, Joseph Wu, warned of looming war. There we go. Okay, China comes in and says, by the way, uh, we're warning you of a looming war with mainland uh, and, called on, and called on Australia to increase intelligence uh, sharing and security. Oh, no, no, this is Taiwan's foreign minister. Sorry. I thought it was Chinese for a second. Ah, China, Taiwan, what's the difference? 
Uh, speak, oh boy. <laughs> Speaking of ABC's China Tonight program in Australia, I couldn't help myself, okay? Leave me alone. Don't judge me. Uh, the PLA were to launch the actual strike. Uh, the island would be would be ready to repel any strike. Okay, so Taiwan's defense is ready, is what they're saying. Again, credit to Lawrence uh, Chung for writing a great piece in uh, South China Morning Post. Sorry for my shenanigans, guys. I know this is a very serious topic, but uh, that's my personality. Okay, what do you guys think? Uh, Ranger says, wow, I know I'm going to hear it. I, the YouTube comments are going to be on fire. I'm going to make a really funny thumbnail and then make fun of all my YouTube people because uh, some of them are idiots. I'd be offending both sides. I know, right? All right. Do you, think, do you guys have anything to add to this? This is the end of the naval news. This is all I got today. All, all we have is a lot of palm faces going on right now. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to stop this before I get in any more trouble. Someone's going to report my YouTube channel to YouTube and try and take it down based on what I said today. But I don't care. Come and get some. All right. We'll be back with some cold waters in a few minutes.